I have uh, this morning sent a letter to Speaker Pelosi asking her to grant me a leave of absence until such time as the Ethics Committee completes its work. The powerful chairman, not so powerful anymore, and a huge embarrassment for the Democrats. That request granted. We'll see if this temporary leave of absence is really temporary. Top line starts right now. Hello and welcome to ABCNews.com's Top Line. I'm David Chalian. And I'm Rick Klein. Each weekday we're bringing you the very latest political headlines, reporting, insight, analysis, everything you need and want to know about politics. And it's Twitter.com slash The Note if you want to answer our question of the day or comment. It's all up to you. Get us started. What is your top line? Wrangle relents. The House Ways and Means chairman bows to the inevitable and steps down from his perch to top the Ways and Means Committee this morning. It is unclear whether this is just going to be temporary or not. It's hard to imagine a scenario where he comes back, David. But this really does highlight a vulnerability for Democrats. They talked about draining the swamp in Pelosi's famous formulation, and, and they've got these ethics problems and wrangle chief among them. He's not leaving the House, and, and they're even calling it a temporary leave of absence. Uh, but you know in this time we don't say ways and means without saying the powerful committee and the powerful chairman. Uh, and it is precisely because they ran on this so hard in 06 to take the majority that this becomes an even greater Achilles heel for them right now. Uh, and you heard him this morning. He did this because of the political impact. He understood that this was going to be a weight around Democratic necks throughout the country in vulnerable districts, and, and, and he wanted to step aside from that. Moving forward, that's what President Obama is trying to do with the health care debate today when he goes before cameras in the East Room, and he will announce a, a couple of things here, Rick. He, he, this is all about providing cover. He's going to say, uh, I've sent this letter, bipartisan outreach, get, give me some street cred for that, please, even though the Republicans are rebuffing it. And as the Democrats on the Hill have demanded, he is going to get in the legislative weeds here. You may not say the word reconciliation, but he's going to say we should do this up or down majority only and Democrats only if that's the way to get it done. Uh, the Democrats on the Hill, as I said, demanded that he do that because they need him to provide some cover for them. That's exactly right. Whether or not he says the word, clearly that's the strategy. Uh, I know some folks on the Hill would like to hear him say reconciliation in so many words, although that's really legislative weeds he doesn't need. But we, uh, talking about trite phrases, we say so many times, this is it. This is the big moment. This is the last chance. You get the sense that maybe we're right this time. This, this, the, there won't be many chances after this one. Texas trouncing. The governor of Texas, Rick Perry, wins the nomination again on the Republican side, beating Kay Bailey Hutchison. It was supposed to be a battle of the titans, but actually he didn't even need a runoff. She is conceded, and he will be the Republican nominee, uh, even though he's been in office for almost 10 years. Re uh, Republican voters, at least in Texas, want to see him continue as governor. Two big questions on this. The first is, will Kay Bailey Hutchison make good on her promise to step down from the Senate, regardless of the outcome of the primary? I think we kind of know the answer to that one. What and is the answer to that? I'm thinking no. no? I'm thinking she okay. sticks around, at least for a little while. Okay. And the other big question, I think, is, is do we start talking about Rick Perry as a 2012 contender? Because he, he's obviously got something going right, and he's tapped into the Tea Party anger. And a month or so ago, Texas Monthly know. did this huge story on, on his 2012 prospects. Uh, I'm not yet buying into Perry's 2012 process, prospects. I think there's uh, a lot of stuff in Rick Perry's past that probably needs shaking out that we just haven't seen him vetted on that kind of national stage yet. But this will certainly give his ego a boost, and, <laughs> and he may consider it, no doubt. Um, it'll be interesting to see the matchup in the fall. Late night laughs. Unbelievable. Last night, coast to coast, dueling comedian couches, and you had two potential 2012 uh, Republican nominees, Sarah Palin on Jay Leno's couch and, and Mitt Romney on David Letterman's couch. And we're going to show you all the highlights a little bit later. And they did okay. There were some laughs there. You need a couple of lines to at least, to at least keep it going. But <laughs> poor Mitt Romney, up against Sarah Palin again. You know, just like <laughs> just, the book. Just not a fair You're fight. Not gonna win. <laughs> we're going to begin with the health care news that's out there today. We're joined from the left, as they used to say on Crossfire. <laughs> Jane Hampshire, founder and publisher of FireDogLake.com. Thank you, as always, for being here, Jane. And uh, the, the president is, is out there today. He's going to lay out this path forward and sort of uh, lead the march for Democrats now to try to get 216 votes in the House. Uh, obviously, the speaker doesn't have the votes yet, or there would have been a vote on the floor already. Um, but in this period, in this month of March, before they go on break, do you see her getting these votes? Is this attainable, this Senate bill with the fixes? I don't see it personally. I mean, if you look at what happened to Charles Rangel, uh, I know that you said that he stepped down for the good of the, the party, but uh, the thing that drove him down was the willingness of 39 freshmen and sophomores in vulnerable seats 
who were signing on to a letter saying, you know, we think that you need to take a break from all of this because it's going to hurt our chances. And that really is what's driving what's going on on the Hill right now. Uh, you've got members of the House whose names are being floated as possible switchers who might support uh, this health care bill, but I frankly don't buy it. If you're looking at someone like Suzanne Cosmas in Florida, uh, she voted no the first time. People are saying she might vote yes. But, you know, look at Bill McCollum in Florida, the attorney general that's trying to say that he will challenge this health care bill, the mandate, as being unconstitutional. He's running for governor. Exactly. He, yeah, yeah. I mean, and you've got uh, 30, you know, states that well, Virginia's already passed the ban on mandates, and you've got 30 states who are considering it. They don't want to fuel that. Mm. So I think that the chances of getting the House to go first and act as cannon fodder for the Senate. Uh, which they really don't want to do is unlikely and also passing a mandate and then running against their own state governments in 2012 is also unlikely. And in interacting with this at least indirectly is uh, an effort that you're involved in right now uh, in, in Arkansas. Blanche Lincoln, no favor to the left, now has a serious primary challenge in, in Bill Halter. You had an announcement out this morning that there's uh, more than five million dollars in commitments uh, between money he's raised and, and outside groups including labor that are willing to jump in to, to help that candidacy. What is the end game here? I mean, do you do you want do you want Bill Halter to be the Democratic nominee? You think he can actually win in Arkansas? Well, I don't know if any Democrat can win in Arkansas. It's a tough year, you know, and Arkansas is moving over into sort of the red zone. But I think if there's any hope, it's Bill Halter. I mean, Bill Halter has run one statewide el you know election before. One of the things that we were the lieutenant governor. It's the yeah. lieutenant governor. One of the things that problems we were facing in trying to recruit primary challenges to corporatist Democrats, really with many of the same challenge problems problems that people on the right have as well to corporatists of both parties who are representing corporate interests over those of their constituents is that the people who might credibly challenge them don't want to give up their existing careers. So we've been working for oh, almost a year to pull the groups together that could, could bring this kind of financial backing. But does that play in Arkansas to be the the million dollar guy totally funded by move on and labor is that is that the Arkansas label for a successful Democrat the 1.2 million dollars has been given in small dollar donations twenty nine dollars a piece Blanche Lincoln's money comes from the lobbyists at Aiken Gump the lobbyists at Patton Boggs Blue Cross Blue Shield I mean one corporation after another the banks she voted for the bailouts I mean there's a real sense that she represents Washington DC and corporate interests and not Arkansas that's the real rub here. And so I think you're going to see Bill Halter running a populist uh, campaign against those votes. I mean, she's on the Ag Committee. She's not only the death of sustainable agriculture for the next 20 years as the chairman, but she actually, her family took $715,000 in agricultural subsidies, and she was the lone Democrat to vote against capping them in 2002 while she was receiving them. I mean, this kind of stuff is not popular in Arkansas, and I think Halter stands a better chance against a Republican in the general than Lincoln does at do this you, point. Do you are you comfortable that he's with you on, on some of the, the, the critical issues that you've been fighting for, like a public option as part of health care reform, like for the labor folks, uh, card check? Well, I think that the, the point, Blanche Lincoln's problem, labor's problem with Blanche Lincoln has been her trade votes, actually. And I think that he is very solidly with labor on that. I don't think card check is going to come up quite frankly. Neither do I think the Don't public option <laughs> is going to come up. I, I think that they kind of know this at this point, but they're more concerned at this point. The steelworkers are the biggest union in Arkansas, and they're getting killed on trade deals. And so we know that Halter is solid on those things. We know he's good against, you know, about banks, you know, the things that are really going to be coming up in the future. So rather than make him swallow a, a, a you know, a, 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 you know, a loyalty test on issues that really aren't going to be germane to what he's fighting, I'm more concerned with things that he, that are going to be coming up that Blanche Lincoln's going to be voting on, like the student loan bill where she wants to give money that should go to students to Citibank. Like, that's what I care about. And I know he's good on that. You mentioned the power of the freshman and sophomore Dems that are most vulnerable this cycle uh, for the Democrats uh, having a lot of power on this wrangle thing. But what about the wrangle episode overall? I mean, is this um, is this a in and of itself a terrible sign for Democrats? I think it's really good. It shows that they actually move to uh, make, you know, impose their own uh, ethics uh, standards on their own party. I mean, we didn't see that during the Republican years. We didn't see the Republicans move to get Tom DeLay out of there. You know, you had to get, you know, where's the hook? 
I mean, you know, it would, that was not an easy thing to do. Right. Nobody wanted to stand up to him. So we had Democrats saying, hey, Charles Rangel, you need to get out of here. And I think that that was an impressive sign for the Democratic Party, just like Ronnie Halter is. It's a sign that the Democrats care about accountability. I think we're, you know, I think this is imperative if we're going to reestablish the brand for 2010 against the damage that's been done by the corporatists. Jane Hampshire, the founder and publisher of FireDogLake.com. Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it.